Well, it's an honor and pleasure to be here on this campus where I went to school and where I teach now. And I like with my uh, Colorado history classes to start them out with the primary source of buildings. And that is the community where you're teaching in. Uh, and one way to get the attention I found of even the most reluctant young students is to drag them into a cemetery. And when they start to see mausoleums or tombstones, somehow they have a creepy, morbid sense of history and you can actually alert them that there was another generation and uh, uh, read some of the tombstones and have them research uh, what you see there. But on this campus, I like to start with this building that we're in, St. Cajetan's, uh, which was the first church built in northern Colorado for Spanish-speaking people. And you can see maybe the curvilinear parapet and the quatrefoil cross out there and all these Spanish traditions incorporated in the architecture of this particular church. And at that point, if some kid in the back of his mind is wandering and I say on top of that, there was a murder here where uh, Father Leo Heinrichs, while serving community, communion, about where you are, was shot and killed by an anarchist. And they still have the chasuble here with the bullet hole in it and whatnot. So that's one way to get their attention. If you could throw a murder or something like that in, of course. But uh, uh, there's also John Kernan Mullen, whose house was here and went to St. Leo's Church, now gone two blocks away. And it's a great lesson in immigrant history that you had these three different Catholic churches here within uh, six blocks of each other. St. Elizabeth's, the great German Catholic church, which I hope you all saw the spire, just uh, two blocks from here, and then St. Leo's, which is gone now, which was at uh, ninth or 10th in, uh, in West Colfax. But Mullen, who went there, uh, he got tired of the Hispanics crowding in his church, so he gave them this lot and helped them build this, this church, which is a great uh, ethnic landmark. They've since moved out to a newer parish out on uh, uh, South Raleigh Street. The other uh, landmark here, and I hope you'll all have a chance to walk through, it's great out there now, I think it's close to 50, uh, walk up to Ninth Street Historic Park, which is one of our most unusual historic districts because nobody rich or famous, nobody you ever would have heard of uh, grew up there. But there's one house there that was the Casa Mayan, and it was the first Mexican restaurant in uh, Denver to cater to gringos. And uh, there the Gonzalez family, uh, it was a typical family, it was their house where the uh, Mrs. Gonzalez originally made uh, tamales and they were so good people would come to the back door and buy them or try to borrow them or steal them or however to get those tamales. So slowly they expanded that place into the Casa Mayan restaurant and the, the kids would dance and, and they had somebody doing Spanish guitar. So you got a whole introduction there to Hispanic uh, culture with that family. Unfortunately, the, the restoration of it includes some history of, the, of that family. But I often tell people, that I suspect that that uh, Gonzalez family with their Casa Mayan did more to, to heal the chasm between English-speaking and Spanish-speaking people than all of the city and federal and state agencies uh, put together. Because once you had your first burrito, once you had your first margarita, you felt a lot better about those uh, people the strange foreigners. Um, believe it or not, I'm just not going to ramble. Uh, talk to you about cemeteries. Oh, and if it's an older group, I lucky I teach people over 21, I get to take them into bars. And of course, their faces always light up when they hear they're going to get a drink, but I take them into an ethnic saloon and talk about the German history or the Italian or the Polish or the different immigrant saloons that you can find. Uh, and, but now that I'm getting in my older ages, I do more of churches and cemeteries and less of, the, less of the saloons. But if you look around your community and your particular school, there are great resources. Here, I love to get people to hop onto light rail. And I, have any of you ridden the whole system? It's a fascinating to ride just to get a look at par in parts of town you'd never see before. You're kind of in the underbelly of Denver getting out of here. But also uh, that there's a great public art building public art projects that RTD did voluntarily. They weren't required to, but there's art that usually commemorates the history. Like if you take light rail up to five points uh, for a look at that, uh, what was once a black ghetto and now um, Hispanic and Anglos are also there, you'll see Dr. Justina Ford's house and a great bust and a statue to this incredible black woman physician who, if you know any old timer of color in Denver area, ask him who they were delivered by. It was probably Justina Ford. 
and she uh, not only delivered black babies, but also a brown and, uh, his, and uh, Asian babies. And these were uh, parents, that, mothers that were afraid that no white doctor would touch them or that they would overcharge them if they went even to Denver General. So they would call Dr. Ford and she would come over to the house and, and deliver the baby. And I think it's like 20,000 kids that she supposedly delivered. And her house is now a museum and a, and a great, and also the Black American West Museum uh, consolidated there. So that's one light rail trip. I do a, a tour for adults more, railroading the Rockies, taking advantage of the 10 surviving passenger railroads that we still have in the state. And there's a cheap and easy one right here in Denver, the South Platte uh, trolley. It takes you from 15th Street down through Elitches and the, the, the amusement parks along the South Platte. Then of course, uh, all of you know about the Historical Society's wonderful Georgetown Loop. Railroad, which welcomes tour groups. Is JJ here? How late do they run into the season? Yeah, with the idea of getting kids aboard, right? Yeah. But that's a fun chair. And not, you not only get the railroad there, but you can also get off and explore the Lebanon mine, an old 1870s uh, silver mine. Uh, and I found it taking people out of class like that, even if they don't learn something, at least you and they get some exercise. Huh? and get out of, of the classroom. And uh, I don't think, I know budgets are tight for you uh, with buses and whatnot, but a lot of you can do with just walking tours. Did one for Ebert School here in Denver of Curtis Park, uh, just to look at that old Victorian neighborhood and the, the types of architecture there. And I was kind of surprised that a lot of those kids actually uh, cared about what a Queen Anne house was or what a Denver Square was or neoclassical or, or whatnot, and got them just looking around at things. Uh, I'm sure you guys have, have heard from Wendell Cox, right, at the Denver Public Library? Are going to hear from him. He'll be wonderful on their incredible resources there and on the newspaper project and how you can read newspapers. And there's probably no better way to immerse your students in history than to get them reading the newspapers for 100 years ago to see what's going on there. Uh, the Colorado uh, History Colorado, the Colorado Historical Study, which will open in October of next year, also has great resources and tours and a whole education department headed by, do all of you know J.J. Rutherford? J.J., you want to stand up and wave? But their specialty is dealing with the fourth spring. Thanks. Okay. Uh, I just came back from the state capitol. Have any of you been to see the new tour there, Mr. Brown's Attic? Uh, and the kids were really enjoying that. You can now walk up the stairs there. It's kind of hard for me to get up there, but the kids didn't have any trouble scampering up those stairs to the very tippy top of the capitol where they have a great video and exhibits uh, on the architecture, on the engineering, on the history. And I was delighted to see they include the social history there of the moms who came in to claim, complain about not getting free lunches at school and whatnot. So it's, it goes beyond the usual just political history of what went on at the uh, state capitol tour. Um, did any of you have any questions? Uh, there's always, you know, the local institutions that lo uh, your local museum is sadly neglected and underpatronized, as you probably know. Give them a call, see if they'll take the kids through and uh, give you a, a, a tour through there. Also, I you know, go to the, the newspapers, the television stations, uh, the, the movers and shakers in your community, and if nothing else, it gets them thinking about you as teachers and education and kids. And uh, most people seem to like a, a mayor or whatever, seem to like to take a day off and talk to fourth graders. I think it's easier to fool them than it is some of us. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, from uh, most cities now in Denver have the, uh, the bike paths along the, the streams and rivers that used to be polluted, used to be where you dump dead bodies and old tires and old refrigerators or whatnot. But now, how many of you have been out on the Cherry Creek path? It's a, a great way to get around and you're, they're, here we're lucky, it's actually separated from the bicyclists, so you don't get run over by a bicyclist walking along that path and to get people down to the gold discovery at Cherry Creek and the South Platte. And uh, traveling around the state, I'm, I'm always surprised at how many communities have done that with what used to be ugly, polluted river slums that you wanted to stay away from. 
Uh, I, I agreed to do this reluctantly to talk about primary sources because I've authored a lot of textbooks <laughs> uh, on Colorado history. <laughs> and I sometimes feel like saying, is anybody listening back there? No. Uh, some feel like saying that although there's a great emphasis on primary sources, we've been interviewing at, at CU Denver History Department for a new Latin American historian, and every single candidate brings up that they use primary sources. And a lot of them use novels uh, or, or things like that, but I almost feel like saying, well, darn it, don't you ever use a textbook? Don't they have to have a basic knowledge of Colorado history or U.S. history or whatever it is? where at least if you've read the book, you have an index to look something up if you come across it in the primary source and don't know what it is or what the context is. Uh, so it's kind of a counter argument from all the other stuff you'll hear today. It seems to me it's important <laughs> to, uh, to at least have them do one textbook uh, where they can get the basic knowledge. Uh, I guess the argument against that is that often you lecture in class uh, from the textbook or, or close to it and it duplicates it. But, uh, that's not always the case, and that may be the chapter they never read uh, anyway. Well, I know I should tell you about one uh, class I did that was kind of an experiment. Continuing education was churches of Denver. And I, we kind of wondered how that would go over, but we went to the Japanese Tri-State Buddhist Church. Have any of you been in there? It's fabulous, and they don't welcome people, but if you call them, they'll tell you you can come to the 10 o'clock mass where they have a translation in English. And you get to see, it's an eye-opener, you get to see this great big golden Buddha and all the Japanese symbolism. And the sermon was, a, I guess they don't call it a sermon, whatever they call it, was about don't even step on a stick and break it. Uh, you know, don't kill an ant. This incredibly wonderful uh, uh, a Buddhist philosophy that was so alien to, to me and I think most of our, our culture. And then we went to the uh, Zion ba Black Baptist Church. And that was uh, more fun than any nightclub I've ever been into. <laughs> Uh, it, it was a service with the drums and a, a saxophone and everything else, and they had a nurse on hand for the people that fainted from the emotional uh, content of these churches. I've probably at least seen them on television, but it was incredible to get in and see that experience of the African-American community. And they were so outgoing welcome, they would actually talk to us uh, uh, outsiders and welcome us there and, and try to fit us in, explain why we were there to all these people who were dancing, carrying on, and whatnot. And then the grand old cathedrals, like St. John's Episcopal Cathedral. And to go back there and show the kids the Adam and Eve window, and you probably can't tell them this story, but you know, Eve originally had no clothes on. Were you all aware of that? And she's very voluptuous, very tempting there in the back with her long blonde hair and very shapely without any clothes. But it got to be so distracting that they had to send back to England to get a big rose bush to in front of her. <laughs> but next time you get a chance to go into St. John's, be sure you go back to the northwest corner and look uh, for that window. And then uh, we took them to Immaculate Conception Cathedral and talked about the, the French immigrants who often get left out, although we have a Platte River and we have a Cache La Poudre River uh, that they generally don't get mentioned at all, the, the French Gothic style there of that cathedral. And then there's the Mennonites and all of these other uh, groups that you realize that, that there is a whole world in, in Denver. It's just a matter of getting out there uh, to explore. Uh, call them first. <laughs> uh, Riverside now is open. And uh, it, it's great. I know a lot of Adams uh, uh, school districts go there, and I take my CU classes there. Call up Riverside Cemetery or Fairmount or uh, Mount Olivet or uh, some of you are from out of state, right? Or whatever the local cemetery is there and, and make arrangements. And they usually are glad to have people there. They, they might try to tell you, sell you a lot or something too or a casket or or whatnot. I uh, got interested in this because when I was in grad school, I was the night receptionist at the Fairmount Mortuary and Cemetery, taking people up to the slumber rooms to see their loved ones, uh, and then seeing the different kinds of caskets you could buy and sell. And I found out actually the people who sell caskets also sell cars. You know, it's a, a status symbol, what you write in the interior, what it should look like, and the exterior and all that. Uh, so yeah, and I'm, I'm sure if you got your kids in to look at caskets, they'd like that. 
the ones I took one to get in there and try them out for size and stuff like that. But,